Saturday Morning Physics is sponsored by the M. Lewis Tiffany Endowment, the Hideko Tomazawa Endowment, the Physics Department, and by gifts from friends of the program. century of evolution of particle accelerators uh, and uh, from about 1910 to where we are now. A little background. A hundred years ago, Ernest Rutherford, a British physicist, studied the atom with alpha particles from radioactive nuclei and learned that the atomic nucleus was a very small fraction of the size of the atom. His research demonstrated the potential discoveries possible with energetic nuclear particles, protons and electrons, as well as alpha particles, which are helium nuclei, which stimulated physicists to find ways to give particles high energy, that is, to invent accelerators. Subsequently, DC machines, Cockroft, Walton, and the Van de Graaff, and the cyclotron, the betatron, linear accelerators, the synchrotron, colliding beam machines, and so on, have been invented. What are particle accelerators good for? Well, the main thing that I've been involved in, and many of us here at the university, is the understanding the structure of matter, the elementary particles, the forces which make up the universe. The analysis and inspection of the interior of things, of organisms like us, cargoes, etc., via x-rays, and so on with high energies produced by particle accelerators. Also, radiation therapy for the treatment of cancer, including x-rays, proton beams, and other atomic nuclei, for example, the nuclei of carbon. Beams, in each case, produced by particle accelerators. Also, uh, particle accelerators are evolving as a system of driving subcritical nuclear reactions for electric power generation sometimes called the energy amplifier. And they may also drive fusion energy reactions in some of the research programs going on now. And other things, including manufacturing processes, etc. This is a quote from Department of Energy's Accelerator f for f America's Future, a book loaned me by Ramon Torres, thank you. And uh, this is a quote from its introduction. Today, besides their role in scientific discovery, particle beams from some 30,000 accelerators are at work worldwide in areas ranging from diagnosing and treating disease to powering industrial processes. Next generation particle beams represent cheaper, greener alternatives to traditional industrial processes. They can give us clean energy through safer nuclear power with far less waste. They can clean up polluted air and water, deliver targeted cancer treatments with minimal side effects, and contribute to the development of new materials. As tools for inspecting cargo and improving monitoring of test ban compliance, accelerators can strengthen the nation's security. Now, I wanted to take a little time here to uh, get you acquainted with some of the terminology that we'll be using and some of the scale of the numbers that we're dealing with. Uh, in the first place, we know what power is about. For example, we know what a 100-watt light bulb is and so on. A watt is one joule of energy per second. And a joule is a metric unit of energy. In electricity, a watt is an ampere of electric current over an electrical potential of one volt. Uh, and one ampere is one coulomb of electric charge uh, per second, that is, the current. Now, an electron has a charge, an electric charge, of 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19th coulombs. That means a decimal point followed by 18 zeros before the 1.6. Uh, so very small. An electron volt is the energy of a particle with the electric charge equal to that of an electron, which it gains when accelerated over a potential difference of one volt. One electron volt is an energy of 
1.6 times 10 to the minus 19th joules. Okay, now, big numbers. An energy of one kilo electron volt, or one keV, is 1,000 electron volts, or 10 to the third eV. An MeV is a million electron volts, 10 to the sixth eV. A GeV is a billion electron volts, or 10 to the ninth eV. And a TeV, T for tera, is a trillion electron volts, or 10 to the 12th. So it is important to understand these numbers because we will be using them. Okay, electrostatic generators. Radioactive nuclei emitted alpha particles and energies in the MeV range. And the first accelerators built achieved energies of about a million volts. There are two concepts which were employed to achieve uh, this high DC energy. One is a Cockroft-Walton accelerator, basically a series of high voltage sources which were stacked so that the voltages added to produce the higher voltage. And then the Van de Graaff generator. And in fact, we have a Van de Graaff generator right here. This is a belt of an insulating fabric which is driven by a motor down here to go round and round and round, and there's a pulley, or there's a wheel up here and a wheel down there. But down here is a high voltage power supply, a few thousand volts, which produces electric charge, which is put onto the belt, and as the belt goes up here, then there's a facility for extracting the charge from the belt, so this sphere acquires a very high electric charge. Now this little sphere is grounded, and when we turn this on, we'll get a spark, which will jump over. Zap, zap, yeah. Okay, uh, so, okay, that's the only demonstration of a particle accelerator I'll be able to give you in track, but okay. But we have some other pictures. Uh, particles accelerated were usually protons, which is hydrogen gas passed through an electrical discharge, which can be ionized in the nuclei, the protons, then accelerated by a high negative voltage, the order of 20 kilovolts, for example, into a vacuum pipe. From there, they move through a vacuum pipe, which is part of the accelerators where they were accelerated to several hundred kilovolts or about an MeV in the Cockroft, Walton, or Van de Graaff generator. Electron beams can also be generated, as in a vacuum tube, by a hot filament in an electric field. Positive electrode pulls the electrons, positive electrode pulls the electrons from the filament, and they can then be directed into a vacuum tube and accelerated. This is a photograph of a Cockroft, Walton, generator, which was, which was in fact at the Fermi Accelerator Laboratory, and it uh, actually is, serves as the injector to the uh, synchrotron at Fermilab. This is the Cockroft Walton power generator, a stack of uh, high voltage units are stacked in series. In here is the elect proton source where the protons are produced and, in fact, then going through this connection in the wall to the uh, rest of the accelerator structure. Okay, um, here is a photograph taken in 1938 of the one million electron volt electron accelerator here at Michigan, built by Dick Crane, who's famous uh, physicist in our department in the earlier years. Photograph of Dick down there in the lower right-hand corner. Uh, again, the different uh, 200 uh, kilovolt units were stacked up on the right side of the figure and uh, then uh, connected over to different electrodes and the accelerating column, the top then uh, where the electrons were produced was at a million volts. And this was in the basement of the Randall Laboratory across the street. In those days, 
the first and second basement were combined into a two-story structure, so there's plenty of room for this. Okay, um, I would, could spend much more time on that, but I want to bring ourselves up to the present and the highest voltage machines, so let's move on to cyclotrons. Moving charge particles are bent in a magnetic field. Uh, B rho equals mv over E is the relevant equation, where B is the magnetic field, rho is the radius of curvature, m the particle's mass, v its velocity, so that mv, mass times velocity, is the momentum, and E the electric charge. So a particle with a charge of one proton or electron in a magnetic field of one tesla, which is 10,000 gauss, where a gauss is about the scale of the Earth's magnetic field, um, and a momentum of 300 MeV over C, an energy relevant unit of momentum, is bent with a radius of about one meter. So for a proton with fixed mass, since the rho radius of curvature is proportional to velocity, the revolution time to go in a circle is constant or independent of energy, and energy is up to about 50 million volts. This made possible a cyclotron, invented by Ernest Lawrence at Berkeley in the early 1930s. The major component of the cyclotron is the um, uniform magnetic field, magnet. Uh, if magnetic field usually vertical. Uh, to accelerate particles, a flat horizontal circular vacuum tank is located in the magnetic field. Within this tank are located two D-shaped copper electrodes placed back to back and hollow inside. They're located within a vacuum tank. The Ds are connected to a radio frequency power source so that an electric field is formed between the two adjacent straight edges of the Ds and protons injected into the center between the Ds experience a radio frequency electric field, which accelerates them. As they gain energy, they spiral outward, gaining energy on each revolution, as the RF frequency is the same as a proton revolution frequency. And this is a little picture I made, which I think makes it a little easier to understand. Here are the two Ds. Uh, this is a vertical, uh, looking down on the uh, structure so that the magnetic field is perpendicular to the drawing here. And in, outside of that is a vacuum tank. Here is a radio frequency power source, so the voltage oscillates this first positive and that negative and then a half cycle later. This is positive and that's negative. Looking at it in a cross-section uh, vertical slice, uh, here are the two Ds, each one is hollow. These are their straight edges right across from each other. The poles of the magnet, the magnetic field vertically here, and a uh, vacuum chamber outside of it, so that the particle starts in the middle, and as the voltage is changed, it gains energy and spirals outward gaining energy on each revolution as it crosses the Ds when the voltage is such a direction as to accelerate it, and finally gets to the outside where it can be run into a target to make radioactive isotopes or nuclear reactions, or can be extracted through a tunnel of some kind. Okay, here's Hermann Reimer, who is the uh, instrument maker in our department in, back in the 30s and 40s with the vacuum chamber and the Ds of the Michigan Cyclotron in 1936. And you can see the tank there and the two D-shaped electrodes. And on the lower left, the two electrodes sticking out, which connected the Ds to the radio frequency power source. Here is Jim Cork standing beside this cyclotron as it was under construction. You can see the coils on the cyclotron magnet and the, the, the vacuum tank with the Ds is on the table uh, to his left or to your right as you look at the screen. Here is the 27-inch cyclotron built at Berkeley by Ernest Lawrence, photographed in 1934. It was Lawrence who invented the cyclotron 
Stan Livingston on his left, or on your left as you look at the picture, uh, was his graduate student then. He went on to be a famous accelerator physicist at MIT and was involved at Brookhaven and their accelerators and so on. Uh, here is a later cyclotron at Berkeley, a 60 inch cyclotron, much higher energy of course. Um, here in Ann Arbor is Harlan Hatcher with former president of the university together with Bill Parkinson who is a uh, member of our department. He's now over 90 uh, and uh, he built this cyclotron out on North Campus in the 1960s. Well, synchrocyclotrons, as particles go faster and faster and their speed becomes not negligible relative to the speed of light, the physics of special relativity becomes relevant. So the particle mass increases with energy and although the momentum is still mass times velocity, uh, the velocity increases more slowly with increasing energy than the momentum. Hence the, in a cyclotron the protons get out of phase with the constant frequency radio frequency uh, accelerating system. Whoops. Um, um, and as their kinetic energy approaches 100 MeV or so. The rest mass of a proton in energy units, E equals mc squared, is about 940 million electron volts. So how do you continue to accelerate protons through this energy? What you do is modulate the radio frequency, reducing the frequency to keep the frequency, the protons in phase in synchronism with the RF, getting additional energy each revolution. <coughs> this was invented by uh, Ed McMillan at Berkeley uh, and then shortly after World War II and simultaneously by Vladimir Vexler in the Soviet Union. Now however, protons are not accelerated continuously but in a bunch. The bunch of protons is injected, the RF accelerates them to a certain energy and then the R accelerating RF frequency is slowly uh, reduced or modulated down to remain in phase with the protons as they gain energy and their velocity increases less rapidly. The bunch of protons eventually reaches the outside of the vacuum tank and is either extracted by an electrostatic or magnetic channel or runs into a target uh, where uh, from which particles may be produced or nuclear reactions take place or the beam extracted. One big factor is the RF phase stability or phase focusing. And just to try to explain that a little bit, uh, suppose of a proton crosses, here is the vector, the magnetic field as a function of time, the voltage between the two Ds and if the proton crosses the gap at this time, this is the voltage it gains and if the radio frequency and the fre change of frequency with time is modulated according to this voltage gain per turn of the proton, then it stays in phase. If the proton arrives a bit late, it actually receives a higher voltage and therefore is propelled faster to catch up with the protons at T0. If the proton arrives early with too much, uh, early in time, then in fact it gets a lower voltage and so uh, uh, slow, slows down enough so that um, it gets back in phase with T0. So uh, this whole scheme is what produces what's called phase focusing and uh, it is a very important factor in the feasibility and maintenance of the uh, synchrocyclotron or the synchrotron concept. 
Hence, accelerated protons are in a bunch, spread somewhat in time and energy, but the bunch will reach full energy at the outside radius of the cyclotron, or target, at about the same time. Large synchrocyclotrons were built during the late 40s and 1950s in many places. In, at Berkeley, Columbia, and Chicago in the United States, Geneva, Switzerland, the first accelerator which was built at the CERN laboratory. CERN stands for Centre European pour la Recherche Nucléaire, but um, <coughs> it's the European Center for Nuclear Research. And at Dubna, near Moscow in the Soviet Union. Also in France, England, Australia, and other places. They accelerated protons to energies of over 100 MeV, that is 300 MeV at Berkeley, 680 MeV in Russia. Uh, here is a photograph of the 184 inch cyclotron at Berkeley under construction, and uh, the magnet and the magnet coils are there, but the vacuum tank with the Ds has not been installed, and all the people involved are pictured here. Here is the 680 MeV cyclotron in Dubna, a photograph taken in 1963, and from the people in the foreground, you get a measure of the scale of the thing, it's pretty big. Now, given the concept of radio frequency modulated accelerators, it was much easier for higher energies to make a ring of magnets in which the magnetic field was also varied in time, from low field at the particle injection to high field at the accelerated full energy. So, as the protons gained energy, they gained at the same, uh, they remained at the same radius. Of course, the radio frequency modulation had to be carefully co coordinated with the magnetic field rise. Note, the synchrotron concept was also applicable to electron accelerators, and with, the injection, with an injection energy of a few hundred kilovolts, <coughs> where the electron uh, velocity was already close to the velocity of light, the accelerating radio frequency required only small modulation, the energy equivalent to the electron um, rest mass is only about 511,000 volts. Okay, at the University of Michigan, we had an electron synchrotron. Here is a photograph taken in 1948 it accelerated electrons to about 120 million electron volts. The first synchrotron to have straight sections, a concept of Dick Crane, which were employed in the all subsequent synchrotrons. The synchrotron is down here in the front, and you can see the straight sections. Uh, this is the injector, a few hundred kilovolt. Uh, well, it's the Cockrell fault and power supply, and then the injector column there, uh, where the electrons are directed down that pipe. Then back, you see a great bank of capacitors. Turns out that the easy way to operate the magnets here was to construct a resonant circuit, with resonant frequency, I forget what it was, five or 10 cycles per second. And the magnetic field then oscillated sinusoidally. When it went just past zero, the electrons were injected, and as the magnetic field rose up to its maximum value, radio frequency accelerated the electrons, they gained energy, and <coughs> then at full energy, they were extracted, run into a target, and then the uh, subsequent uh, three quarters of a cycle, the magnetic field went down through zero, negative, came back, and after it, pass through zero again, the next bunch of electrons was injected. Okay, electron synchrotrons were built at many US university laboratories around the United States in the 40s and 50s. Iowa State University had a 70 MeV machine. We had the 120 MeV machine. Uh, the Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory, 300 MeV, MIT, and Purdue also 300 MeV. Illinois had a betatron of about 300 MeV. Caltech and Cornell had higher energy machines. I don't have exact figures of what their energies were, but about 500. Okay, now another uh, piece of physics. Um, I take a little time out for this physics. 
focusing betatron oscillations, actually called betatron oscillations because Don Kirst, who built the betatron, was the first person to go through this and understand it. Uh, the accelerated beam orbit remains at a constant, uh, the order of, this is the constant orbit radius of the stable um, particles. Now, if a particle gets higher than the equilibrium orbit, there is a horizontal component of the magnetic field which bends the particle back down toward the middle. And uh, below the median orbit is the component of the magnetic field which is the opposite direction which bends the particles up. So the combination of these two field components is to make the particles want to go back to the equilibrium orbit. And they then, as the particles go round and round, uh, they may oscillate vertically about this equilibrium orbit. Now, the vacuum, t uh, the magnetic field gradient must increase less rapidly, or pardon me, the field must decrease less rapidly than the radius increases. That is so that, for example, a particle that finds itself outside of the equilibrium orbit has a strong enough field so it will bend back and cross the equilibrium orbit at some place further around the revolution. And uh, inside, it will also come around and cross back over the orbit uh, later on the revolution. So there is both horizontal and vertical of stability or stable oscillations about the equilibrium orbit. Um, and that is called betatron focusing. So it is necessary in a synchrotron or a synchrocyclotron to have focusing in both horizontal and vertical and the um, time-like or energy-like dimensions, all three coordinates of the particle. Okay, the betatron. In 1940, Don Kirst made the first betatron. Later, electrons, earlier electrons were called beta rays, as that's why he named it the betatron. It accelerated electrons in a magnetic, in a magnet at fixed radius, but with a magnetic field increasing with time as the electrons gained energy. The acceleration was provided by a magnetic core in which the magnetic field increased with time, hence inducing a voltage circulating around this core, exactly as the core of a transformer induces voltage in its secondary. The magnet core and the magnetic guide field of the, for the electrons are driven by an increasing electric current in the coil around the magnet. Kirsten has made betatrons of energies between about 20 and 300 MeV during the 1940s and 50s. Linear accelerators are linex. Accelerators in straight lines without magnetic field with radio frequency accelerating systems have been used since about 1950 for accelerating both electrons and protons. The basic idea is to have an RF resonant cavity. The particles are exposed to a longitudinal electric field um, while the field is accelerating them. But then when the field is reversed, the other half of the RF cycle, uh, the uh, electrons coast into a metallic drift tube, a metallic conducting pipe, which shields them from the electric field. When they emerge from the drift tube, the radio frequency field has reversed, so the particles are accelerated again. So this uh, large tank with a set of drift tube pipes in it, uh, takes protons or electrons and gives them a boost of energy each time they cross between the drift tubes so they can build, build up to an energy of, you know, well, the order of 50 million electron volts. And this has been used as an injector for high energy synchrotrons. Uh, in fact, electron linear accelerators are used uh, with energies up to one or two billion electron volts, for example, at the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center, or SLAC, 
as it's called, on the West Coast. I could spend a lot of time on betatrons and linear accelerators, but we just don't have time. So what I'm going to do is go ahead with our synchrotrons. This is the first synchrotron that was built, completed, um, uh, for protons. This is the Cosmotron at Brookhaven, named Cosmotron because it reproduced some of the things that had been discovered in cosmic rays. And uh, this is a series of magnets you can see here around the ring. Uh, and it's a, a sizable structure producing 3 billion volts. Here is a Bevatron at Berkeley, 6 billion volts in 1956. Now, again, you see all the magnets. You see the straight sections where the injection, the radio frequency acceleration, and so on and so forth were placed. Now, actually, these are all early pictures because later uh, concrete shielding blocks were placed all around and over these things to protect the people from any possible radiation. Uh, and in fact, if the beam struck the inside of the machine, it produced radiation. And so the radiation safety is, in fact, a consideration for all of these machines. Here are some snapshots of the Dubna 10 billion volt synchrotron. These shots were taken about 1963. However, it was learned that this was being built in the mid-50s and this stimulated the Argonne or the, the Department of Energy or Atomic Energy Commission in those days to authorize the construction of a 12 and a half billion volt machine at the Argonne Laboratory. Well, in the 1952, the year the Cosmotron was completed, the concept of alternating gradient air, AG, or strong focusing, was invented by Courant, Livingston, and Snyder at Brookhaven. If you have a positive gradient, that is DBDR positive, followed by a negative gradient, that is DBDR negative, the net result is focusing in both radial and vertical dimensions. The result is much stronger focusing in both dimensions than is possible with a single gradient, such as I described before. Now, um, what I've taken here is the optical analog of uh, this focusing. That is, here is a plano convex lens. Parallel light rays are converged to a focal point. Here is a plano concave lens, that is a uh, concave surface here, and light rays then diverge. But if you put one and then the other, the net result is a convergence. And I drew it here with the concave first and then the convex, but it also works with the convex first and the concave second. When this was first I invented and discussed and I learned about it, I found it interesting to build an optical analog. These were some lenses I made in 1953. These are analogous to the magnetic lenses. That is, each one is a concave, that is a plano concave cylindrical lens, uh, and you can see that curved surface, and then it's cemented to a plano convex cylindrical lens, and the two flat surfaces are glued together so that the result is a combination plano convex and plano concave lens. And if I look at the other one, it's exactly the same thing, only I actually have this one stuck on a plate here, perpendicular. And we can actually make a picture here. If I turn this on, here is a, a light source, and here are the two lenses. And if I adjust the position of the two lenses properly, I actually what I get is a focal line, a vertical line. Uh, actually, if I 
invert the lenses, actually I get a horizontal line. But this is more or less focused in both dimensions. Um, this idea of strong focusing has been universally adopted. Here is the way a magnetic quadrupole focusing lens works. And like my optical analogs there, this will be focusing in one dimension and defocusing in the other. And okay, it says here, it's simple to make a quadrupole lens, a magnet with a vertical component which varies linearly from strong up to strong down as you go horizontally, that is as you go strong up, it, here and then it gets weaker and weaker, the field is zero there, and then it gets stronger and stronger, but in the opposite direction, that way. And then as I go up here, it is uh, stronger and weaker, going left to right, and then I go up here and it's going right to left, weaker and stronger and stronger. So uh, this would focus a positive particle uh, horizontally, uh, that is this way, the particle would oscillate around that, but vertically, it would be like one of my diverging lenses. So, um, one of cylindrical lenses. So, this is the way the strong focusing operates. Well, strong focusing synchrotrons, the invention of strong focusing led to the construction of two very productive uh, synchrotrons during the late 50s at the Brookhaven Laboratory, a 30 billion volt alternating gradient synchrotron, or AGS, was completed in 1960. The West European countries formed an organization, CERN, now called the European Center for Particle Physics, in Geneva, Switzerland, where they built a 28 GeV proton synchrotron, or the PS, completed in 1959. Both facilities were extremely productive for decades, producing a great deal of new physics. Both laboratories continue to be major research facilities, to this day. Here is an interior view of the CERN 28 billion volt proton synchrotron taken about 1960. This is the site of the synchrotron. You see this uh, ring of dirt here. The synchrotron is under that. Uh, the building is covered over with dirt for radiation shielding. The radius of this is about 100 yards. Um, experiments were done in this building uh, there are laboratories and then the big office building here, and so on. So that's the CERN laboratory back in the 1960. Now, I'm going to digress a minute because in 1953, after the Cosmotron started and the Bevatron was nearly running, senior Midwest physicists sought to evolve a regional laboratory in this part of the country and an accelerator facility. Donald Kirst, who invented the Betatron, headed up this study group, mostly of young physicists, like me, I was young then, uh, which pursued this goal for about a dozen years, summer studies, mostly discussion meetings, and after 1956, a Wisconsin-centered laboratory and a center. Um, from these studies came many significant advances in accelerator design. The fixed field, alternating gradient concept, a spiral sector focusing, much better understanding of our radio frequency focusing, and the colliding beam concept. And we said innovation was not enough be because although we really wanted to build a laboratory in the Midwest with a very significant high energy machine, uh, it never came to pass. And so the organization kind of disbanded about 1965 um, and so on. Well, here are a couple of pictures. Here was a study group here in uh, Ann Arbor in Randall Laboratory. Uh, anyhow, this was the first uh, machine we made. This is a fixed field alternating gradient. It has alternating gradients because the magnetic field increases in all magnets as you go radially outward, but the polarity of this magnet is backwards. 
Uh, so the magnetic field here bends the particles uh, around the center of the circle. Here it's bent away. Here it's bent around. So in a matter of fact, the, sink, the uh, equilibrium orbit of the particles is kind of a scallopy circle wiggling around, but it achieves both horizontal and vertical focusing. The magnetic fields are constant in time, but increasing with radial uh, distance from the center, so the particles ejected at low energy here can be accelerated up a factor of 10 in energy, although increasing in radius by much less than a factor of two. Acceleration at this point was conduct, uh, achieved by a betatron process. So that's a betatron core there. Uh, and uh, so um, it we later added a radio frequency core. Uh, this is a photograph of uh, when we were at Madison, giving you a, a better picture for the scale. Uh, I like this picture because their very significant visitor, uh, Niels Bohr. This is another invention of Mira. It's called so-called spiral focusing. Here you see magnets. They're all of the same polarity, but cursed pointed out that if a particle leaves a magnetic field at an angle to the edge of the magnet, which is not 90 degrees, it also experiences, if it's away from the median plane, a horizontal component of the field, which on one side of the magnets will be focusing vertically and defocusing horizontally, and on the other side of the magnet will be focusing uh, horizontally and defocusing vertically. So it's a may, way of achieving alternating gradient focusing, and all the magnets have the same polarity. And this was a, a model made at Madison and uh, about the same scale as our um, other machine I showed you. I've accelerated electrons, and again you see a betatron core for accelerating the electrons. So we did study uh, these two magnet options. Now, more recently, just to give you a feeling for the scale of things, here is a big cyclotron-like magnet uh, being constructed at the Triumph Laboratory in Vancouver, Canada. And with the guy standing around on it, you can get a feeling for the scale. It's a pretty huge thing. Well, modern cyclotrons, which have this spiral focusing uh, are now all over at Berkeley, an 88 inch cyclotron, at the Swiss Paul Scherer Institute, a 590 MeV cyclotron. Pro in each case, this is a proton energy. The Triumph machine, I showed you a picture of, 520 MeV. Uh, the Riken uh, facility in Japan is actually. Uh, four cyclotrons with each one feeding beams to the next highest energy one. I don't know the upper energy there. And here at Michigan State University, a very significant research facility with a couple of very energetic cyclotrons, 500 and 1200 MeV, used for both uh, proton but also heavy ion research. And uh, for example, Kolkata in India, 520 MeV cyclotron. And this isn't the end of the list, but an example. Okay, larger proton synchrotrons. In the early 60s, both Europe and America were, there was great interest in building more energetic synchrotrons in view of the discoveries with the 30 GeV machines, hints from cosmic rays and so on. Because the machines would be larger than the size of existing laboratories and more expensive, than other generation accelerators. In both the US and Europe, there was frustration over finding a site. In the US, the National Accelerator Laboratory, later renamed the Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory, or Fermi Lab, was established near Chicago. In Europe, the CERN Lab extended its site into France. Both began construction of 200 to 400 GeV synchrotrons. Here is a photograph of the Fermi Lab site. Um, the radius here is about one and a quarter miles or four miles in circumference. 
The laboratory central buildings are still under construction here. This is the injector, it's called the booster. Uh, the Van de Graaff is back over here in a linear accelerator injected into the booster, which then injected protons of about eight billion volts into the main accelerator ring. Well, the, in the early 80s, a second ring of superconducting magnets was added in Fermilab accelerator tunnel to extend the accelerator capabilities to almost a trillion electron volts uh, energy. With superconductivity, they were able to achieve magnetic fields of over twice that possible with normal copper conductor. Iron return yoke magnets, hence more than doubling the energy. This is called, first, the energy doubler, or later, the Tevatron. Subsequently, later, in 1980s, the main ring original accelerator was removed, replaced by a second ring in another tunnel, which accelerated the protons to about 200 billion volts, and they then injected them into the Tevatron ring, used to accelerate both protons and, later, antiprotons to achieve colliding beams with energy of about two trillion volts. Here is the accelerator tunnel at Fermilab showing the two sets of magnets, the upper one, the 400 GeV synchrotron, the lower ones, the superconducting magnets of the Tevatron. Okay, uh, yeah, this is the last topic and I'll hopefully finish on time. High energy elementary particle physics, when two particles collide, new particles may be produced and enough, enough energy is present. For example, pi mesons, uh, the production of proton-proton collisions, uh, two, pro, one, two protons collide and coming out you have a proton, a neutron, and a positive pi meson. Um, when one is in motion and the other at rest, Conservation of momentum requires that the combined pair move forward after the collision at half the incident speed. Hence, only half the incident particle energy is available for making new objects. For example, in the case of the rest mass in energy units to the pion of about 140 MeV, then the incident proton must have a kinetic energy of about 300 MeV to produce the reaction. If the particles are very energetic with a kinetic energy much greater than the rest mass, their velocity is close to the velocity of light, C. The center of mass energy is a much smaller fraction of the incident kinetic energy. So for example, uh, we'll call the kinetic energy uh, much greater than the rest mass energy, E0, which is M0C squared. In the collision of two identical particles, each of mass M0, <coughs> one at rest, one moving with an energy E1. The center of mass energy squared is given by E center of mass squared equals 2 E0 E1. Thus, with the rest mass equivalent to about 940 MeV, almost a billion volts, a proton of an energy of 200 GeV colliding with a stationary proton produces a collision with an energy in the center of mass of only about 20 GeV only about 10%. The solution, then, to achieve high center of mass energies, collide two beams of the same energy head-on. Then, for example, the collision of two 200 GeV protons produces 400 GeV in the center of mass. Now, with electrons, same principle, but the electron rest energy rest mass energy, is only about 511 kilovolts. So the use of colliding beams has been most important in electron-electron and electron-positron studies since about 1960. The first electron-electron colliders were built at the Frescati Laboratory in Italy, at Stanford, uh, the SLAC laboratory, at MIT, at Novosibirsk in Siberia, at Hamburg, uh, the Deutsches Electron Synchrotron Laboratory in Germany, with energies of tens to hundreds of MeV. Electron positron colliders were then also built at many of these sites, and energies were boosted to over a billion volts per beam. Many significant physics results resulted from studies with these machines. 
Here is the, one of the first electron-electron storage rings as seen in the early 50s at the High Energy Physics Lab on the Stanford campus. This was before the SLAC laboratory was built near Stanford. It took many years to make these rings able to produce physics and to establish much more stringent tests on the validity of quantum electrodynamics. That is, electrons are stored in each of these two rings, accelerated in linear accelerators, not shown, but injected into the rings, and the two rings were tangent at that point, where you can see them together back there, and that's where the experiments were done. Adone was the first of the large electron-positron storage rings. This figure shows the ring during construction at the Fascati Laboratory, which is near Rome in Italy. Operation commenced about 1969. And of course, with electrons and positrons, they can circulate in the same ring, just circulating in opposite directions. So you could, it saves a lot of hardware, but of course you have to have a positron source and that has its own complications, but it has been resolved and works. Now, LEP. At CERN, it was decided to build a very large electron-positron colliding beam facility, which was begun on about 1980. This collider, the Large Electron-Positron Collider, LEP, which collided beams of about 100 GeV each, or 200 GeV center of mass, was completed about 1990. It was built in a tunnel, oh, over 100 to 300 feet underground, and 27 kilometers, or 17 miles, in circumference. A great deal of excellent physics was done there. We had a Michigan group there uh, working on one of the four experiments, the L3 experiment, which included myself and others, and was directed by uh, Sam Ting, who, as we just heard, is going to be our Saturday morning physics speaker next week. This is an aerial photograph of the uh, location of the ring. The CERN laboratory, which I saw showed you in a 1960s photo, is back there. This dotted line is a French-Swiss border. This part is in France, and this part is in Switzerland. <coughs> in the foreground, is the Geneva Airport. The city of Geneva is down over here. <clears throat> These are various suburbs. And this ring here is the 400 GeV proton accelerator ring. This larger ring is the LEP ring. That is 27 kilometers, or about 17 miles, <coughs> in circumference. And the little blobs there, 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 and there represent where experiments are located. Now, give you a little better idea, go back to the map. That is the, uh, just a map of the thing. And again, here is the ring. And Again, as you saw in the photograph, it's under normal uh, civilization. There are villages, farms, roads, activities, which are undisturbed by this great accelerator. The little blobs here indicate where there are structures and uh, wells going down to the site of the accelerator and so on and again, the Central CERN Laboratory. So this has all been done and it worked and uh, a great deal of good physics was done there. This is a photograph inside the tunnel. You get a sense of the radius of curvature by looking down the distance there. and <laughs> It's a big, big ring. Okay, well it worked. Use strong focusing, of course, and everything worked. Well, proton, 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 antiproton colliding beams, and I'm just about finished. The first proton, proton colliding beam machine was the intersecting storage rings at CERN, built in the 1960s. It took 30 billion volt beams from the CERN proton synchrotron, put them in two storage rings which intersected, 
at different points around the circumference. That is, they had the same centers, but were um, not perfect circles, but kind of rectangular circles, rotated 45 degrees from each other, so they overlapped at four points. This is a badly focused photograph, but again, you can see uh, one ring here and another ring inside, and the collision points were not visible uh, outside of the scope of this photograph, but in both directions. You get a feel for the scale of it from this stepladder here. Well, <clears throat> at Fermilab, um, the Tevatron was completed during the 80s and has been operating successfully ever since, colliding protons and antiprotons of almost a trillion volts each to achieve two trillion electron volts in the center of mass, equivalent to an antiproton of about 2,000 trillion electron volts incident on a stationary proton. So two experiments, DCDF and D0, have been successfully operating there for about 20 years, and indeed, we have significant uh, participation of our Michigan faculty in these experiments and have had for decades. Here is a photograph of Fermilab uh, currently. This is the new uh, main injector, lower 200 GeV ring, and here is the ring which contains the Tevatron uh, and it used to contain the 400 GeV proton accelerator, but of course it's now filled with the superconducting magnets. And here is the central office building and so on of the laboratory. <clears throat> and that's on a site of about, I think it's about 7,000 acres or over 10 square miles. Here is a photograph inside the Tevatron tunnel. You see the magnets which were in the photograph I showed earlier but the other main ring, the original magnets are removed and just the superconducting magnets exist. Uh, during the 1990s, CERN decided to replace the LEP E plus E minus collider with a proton-proton collider following the conclusion of the LEP operations in about 2000. Installation of the very high field superconducting magnets in the LEP tunnel began. Protons accelerated by succession of accelerators were injected into the two-way rings and accelerated to higher energies, currently up to about three and a half trillion electron volts each. The collisions thus achieve seven trillion electron volts in the center of mass, equivalent to a 25,000 trillion electron volt proton on a stationary proton. In about two years, the energy will be doubled to 14 trillion volts in the center of mass. Currently, the machine is studying lead-lead collisions through November and December, but it'll go back to proton-proton collisions after the first of the year. This is a photograph inside of the LEP tunnel showing its superconducting magnets in their cryogenic pipes. And again, you get a feeling for the scale. Again, it's a tunnel that uh, was was the electron-positron collider, which you saw in the early slide. So, in conclusion, electrons, accelerators make possible the studies of elementary particles and nuclear interactions at energies between a million electron volts and several trillion electron volts. From the experiments at these accelerators around the world, we've learned a great deal about the structure of matter, energy, elementary particles, and so forth. There are also many other applications of accelerators in medicine, power generation, industrial processes, processing, and national security. So, thank you. Saturday Morning Physics is sponsored by the M. Lewis Tiffany Endowment, the Hideko Tomazawa Endowment, the Physics Department, 
and buy gifts from friends of the program.